Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I want to share with you this morning some uh, some thoughts that I have, and really what I feel like the Lord has laid on my heart for this morning. Uh, how many of you know that in times like these, we need to hear from God? Yes, we don't need to hear from men. We need to hear from the Lord. And I'm very conscious of that. And knowing that, I have probably sought the Lord for this message more so than I have many, many uh, messages I've ever preached or ever taught because I recognize the times that we are living in. And I think I want to just begin in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 12, if you have your Bible. Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, for he knows that he has but a short time. Or in another translation, he knows that his time is short. Clearly there was a time when the enemy, we would know him as Lucifer, was in heaven. Before he had fallen, he was one of the great archangels. He had worshipped the Lord, apparently. But there was a time when he became self-conscious. And he began to say in his heart, I will ascend into the hill of God. I will ascend into the sides of the north. And I will be like the most high God. And as a consequence of that, he effectively led a rebellion in heaven that caused so much havoc that this verse speaks for itself. Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. In other words, rejoice because this troublemaker, this problem, this that was trying to destroy heaven, this that was trying to divide heaven between those who would follow him and those who would follow God has been cast out. They're rejoicing. They're celebrating. But at the same time, there is a woe connected to that because this troublemaker has been cast into this earth to cause the same kind of trouble, the same kind of havoc, and all of those things that he was doing in heaven. And understand this morning that since the enemy has entered into the world and since there are many things that he is doing, Everything is boiling down to two basic propositions. What is God doing? And what is the enemy doing? I mean, you're still with me. What is God doing? And what is the enemy doing? And we know very clearly, okay, what those two things are. And I just want to share some thoughts with you along this line. I've titled this message this morning, Navigating during perilous times. Navigating during perilous times. How many of you know when it's really dark outside, especially if you were on the ocean, you would need a means of navigating where you were going. You need a way to get through, especially if you were, if you were on the ocean or maybe you were getting near the shore, you would need to be able to tell whether danger was ahead, okay? You need to be able to navigate these things. And how many of you know things have gotten to the point to where there is so much going on in the world? You know, in my lifetime, I can tell you, I remember just living just several blocks to the north of here over at 209 North Kensington. And we had some faithful people who would drive the church bus or the church van as it was in those days and would pick my brother Ronnie and I up and take us to church. And I had a front row seat to church. My parents weren't in church, they didn't serve the Lord, but we came on the van or the bus. And I would hear messages related to the last days. I mean, it was a big thing back in the 70s. I don't even remember that. I mean, there were movies coming out, Thief in the Night. It was about, you know, what things are going to be like, about the time of the coming of the Lord. And I used to literally tremble when I would hear about the end times. I would think, oh, what's it going to be like? This is going to be horrible. I would be driving down the road with my parents or my mom in the car and something Brother Birch had preached would come to my mind and I would tremble 
at the thought of what was coming upon this earth. But there are a tremendous amount of things that are coming. And if we understand the word of God, we will know that God has already prophesied all of this. There isn't anything that has taken God, even remotely, by surprise. Did you know that in the book of, the, uh, book of Daniel, the Bible said that the day was coming when knowledge was going to be increased exponentially. Mm -hmm. And that many will travel to and fro. Most of you here probably can't remember a day when there wasn't a such thing as a cell phone. Or the internet. Hmm? Many of you don't remember what it was like to live under the threat or the fear of nuclear war. I remember when I was a young teenager, it was almost like they were, you know, showing the Russians like they had one finger on the button and another with a bottle of vodka in their hand. Yeah. And that's the kind of fear that we lived under. Like any moment, every time you turn on the six o'clock news, it was Walter Cronkite and the Russians are about to push the button again. Yeah. How many of you are with me? These are the times that existed even in the last 30 or 40 years. But none of it took God by surprise because God had already prophesied that the day would come that there would be a plague that when it happened, that the flesh would be consumed from a body and leave just the bones that would fall over and crumble. before The, the flesh would leave the body before the bones could hit the ground. People thought, wow, how could that ever happen? There was a movie that went... Uh, about nuclear war years ago, you might remember, here's a person holding onto the fence, you see the flash of light, boom, the bones hit the ground. The flesh was consumed from that nuclear blast. Prophesied thousands of years before it was possible. People would mock, they would scoff. How are people going to ex, uh, ex you know, potentially communicate or travel? I've traveled to England 11 times, uh, 8 times, I wish it was 11, and it's only 8. I've had probably 2 or 3 near misses, right? We canceled last, the last trip. But understand that I can leave Kansas City and I can be in London in 10 hours. Do you realize that 200 years ago, you couldn't even travel across this country in months? Months. Not days. Not hours. They thought when they traveled across country on, on a steam uh, train that they were making some progress. We wouldn't even tolerate that today. Right? But you see, all of this was prophesied thousands of years ago. And for people who are, who are at least somewhat attuned to the scripture, they know these things. I want to you have your Bible, turn to 2 Peter 1, verses 17 to 21. I want you to notice something here. For he received from God the Father, that's the Lord Jesus, honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. In other words, Peter is saying, we were eyewitnesses to when Jesus was transformed on the Mount of Transfiguration. We seen it. We heard the audible voice from heaven. We heard the voice that came from heaven when we were with him in the holy mountain. And so we have this prophet. He said, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well, watch this, to give heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. That's 2 Peter 1, verses 17 and following. What is he saying? He is saying that even though we saw the Lord Jesus transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, we were eyewitnesses to this, there was still, there is still an even greater, think about it, an even greater proof, an even greater evidence of the authenticity of the things of God, and that is a fulfilled prophecy. A fulfilled prophecy, when especially it has been given thousands of years ago, 
the probability is so astronomical that you have to conclude that this is the Lord. This is God's word. And we have been warned about the things that are happening today many, many years ago, thousands of years ago. I want you to just have a look real quick at Luke chapter 17. And there are so many verses that I wanted to share this morning, but we just don't have time. But I just want to sort of point you that way if you'd like to maybe look at it this week. Notice this, Luke 17, verse 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when, until the day when Lot went into Sodom, and fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all, so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let no one who is on the housetop come back for his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let no one who is in the field turn back. And then we have these three words. Remember Lot's wife. Why should we remember her? Remember Lot's wife. What did she do? Listen, when the evidence of God's judgment was swirling over her head, she defied God. You see what I'm saying? With God having said, do not look back. She sees all of these things happening. What ended up happening? She turned around and she turned into a pillar of salt and was judged instantly by God. Think of that. Think of the, the things that the Lord is trying to convey to us in these passages here. As it was in the days of Noah, they were doing all these things. When the days of Lot, they were doing all these things. Listen, it was business as usual to them. Yeah. People were past being alarmed by the circumstances. Yeah. They were hardened to the circumstances. Maybe they had heard Noah say it one too many times. You guys better get your life together. You better get on the ark because, you know, good times are about to go bad. And they heard it so many times that they just mocked. One of the things that the Bible said happened in the days of, of Lot, when the angels came to visit, one of the things that the sons-in-laws did, it was as someone had mocked when he said, we got to get out of here. The angels have come. They've warned us. This place is about to be destroyed. It was like someone was mocking. How many of you know that the world today just loves to mock at the things of God? They just like to make it the biggest joke and just laugh ah, ha, ha, about the things of God. The Bible said, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. I want you to think about this. It was like they had their foot on the very precipice of total annihilation, but yet it's business as usual. This is nothing happening. No big deal. They're not worried about it. They're not even preparing themselves in any way. You say, well, why does that happen? Well, look at some of the things that were happening in the times of Noah. How could they be so distracted? Well, the Bible said that the whole earth was filled with violence. Violence. The thoughts and the imaginations of people were only ever evil continually. Think about that. How many of you ever mixed your Kool-Aid just a little too strong? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Imagine, imagine though, that your thoughts were only wicked without mixture. Undiluted. Just complete evil and wickedness. That was what it was like. The people were violent. Every part of the flesh had corrupted its own way upon the earth. And here was God's estimate. It had grieved God in his heart that he had even made man on the earth. Think about that. 
And what did God say? This is the part that I want to focus on at this point in this message. He said this. He said, my spirit will not always strive with man. Genesis 1, I believe that's verse 3. For he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. By implication, God is saying, I've been striving with them. I've been dealing with them. I've been dealing and dealing and dealing and dealing. And there's going to come a point when I'm going to stop. I'm not always going to strive. You say, what does it look like when God is striving? Well, in the book of Psalms, you probably know this, and I won't go into it real in depth, but... David is explaining a time in his life when he was running from God. He had sinned with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and he was trying to cover it up. How many of you know we don't like to expose our sins? I mean, he did everything in his power to sweep that under the rug. I mean, it was insane what he was doing. But I want you to notice, if you read this, I believe this is Psalm chapter 32, he said, The hand of the Lord was heavy upon me. How many of you have ever been under conviction? You don't have to raise your hand. How many of you have ever really been under conviction? Where you knew God was dealing with you. And you knew he was dealing strongly with you. But yet, sadly, these people who were being dealt with of God were just resisting God. They were not listening. Listen, they were on the very precipice of total destruction. God is warning them and warning them, warning them through the mouth of one of the greatest men who ever walked the earth, which was Noah. I mean, he was one of only eight people who survived this cataclysm that destroyed the entire earth. They they weren't listening to him. They were resisting. When you get all the way over to the book of Acts, chapter number six and number seven, you have this sermon that Stephen gives, one of the things that God said, talking to the religious people, he said, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Here you have Paul, who's part of the crowd, he was Saul at that time. He's listening to what's being said, but he still did not respond. Imagine being told, You've always been resisting the Holy Spirit your entire life, just like your fathers, and you still do not respond. I'm talking about people being so hardened. They're being so callous that no matter what you say to them, they're not changing. No matter what happens in the world. I mean, listen to me. How much crazier has it got to get? I'm just asking. I mean, how much crazier can it get? I mean, where are we at on the diet? Are we at two? Are we at five? What does the dial go to? But yet still you would think that the churches would be packed out. You would think that people would be running to the churches. This is what I heard about when I used to go to church when I was a young child. These are the things that I remember being preached and they're just trying desperately to there's just something about the hearts of people. How many remember when Pharaoh was seeing the miracles and the frogs that happened and you know, and then his magicians could do the frogs, but then they came the lice, they couldn't duplicate the lice. And and the, the, the they told him, This is the finger of God. That's what his magicians told him. This is the finger of God. This is God. We can't duplicate this. Do you think Pharaoh said, you know what? It's time for me to straighten up? Hmm? You think he said, wow, you know, God's pretty powerful. He's more powerful than my all these soothsayers I've got. They didn't do it. He only hardened himself even more. No matter what the evidence was, no matter what was happening, everything that God had designed to turn this man only hardened him more. Think about Paul and God gave him one last chance, as we know, on the road to Damascus. One of the things Jesus said to him was so vitally important. He said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you. The word hard is a word that almost means treacherous. 
it's an awful thing for you to kick against the goads. This was an expression that was used in ancient times by the Hebrews. And what it meant was sometimes when you have someone who's being obstinate, you would have to deal with them in a difficult way. How many of you know that in ancient times in Israel, even to this day, they don't have a whole lot of dirt? Have you ever seen pictures of Israel, right? It is in Kansas. It's not Nebraska, right? So when they're plowing a field, they've got to make sure the rows are straight. I mean, if the, if the tractor goes left and right in Kansas, it's no big deal, but not so in Israel. They had to have the rows straight, take advantage of every square inch of the land. So what would happen? When they couldn't steer the oxen, when they wouldn't follow through, they had somebody walk alongside with an ox goad and would goad that animal to get it to go straight. Goad it. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing? You know, I'm not going to do what this driver's telling me to do. I'm just going to go this way. It's like, well, not really. <laughs> and just kept goading. And notice that in Acts 26 and, and the other cognate passage going back earlier, the word is in the plural. It is hard for you not to kick against the goad, singular. The goad's plural. This means that God was using all kinds of means, all kinds of measures to get his attention, to turn him into the way of the gospel, but he would not turn. He was being obstinate. The word kicking, it's almost just what it implies. How many of you have ever seen a, 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 one of these rodeos? Hmm? And they start digging the spur into the side of one of those bulls. How many of you know good times can go bad for the rodeo clowns? Hmm? You see what I'm saying? They can kick and kill a person. And this is the picture. Rather than being submissive, you are kicking. Like you're trying to kick that which is trying to change you out of your life. Kick it out of the way so it can't deal with you anymore. Well, thankfully, Saul looked up and said, Lord, who are you? And he humbled himself before God. But I want you to know this morning that God is goading us. With his word. He's dealing with us. Maybe it's not something that radical. He's dealing with our hearts. To get us to turn to him. While at the same time. Listen to me. The devil is trying to provoke you. In every way he can. So that you are not sensitive to God's dealings. I can't think of how many times. In the last several months, the devil's tried to provoke me to wrath and anger. Who's with me? I'm not getting a whole lot of head nods. Everybody must just be like, you know, <laughs> who was it, you know, in the, you know, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> hmm? Let me tell you, the devil's trying to provoke us to wrath in so many ways. He's trying to provoke us with fear with this pandemic. He's trying to keep people fearful and angry. Did you know the Bible says, be angry and sin not? Mm -hmm. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Watch this. Neither give place to the devil. Mm -hmm. The word place is the Greek word topos. We get our word topography from it. I don't know if you've ever seen a topographical map. Mm -hmm. Don't give the devil a landing strip in your life because you're angry. Don't give him one of those helicopter platforms you see over on the side of the hospital when you go through the ER. Have you ever seen that? The red light flashing, look at the wind sock going. The devil wants to put one of those in your life. So he can just land, unload, and bring havoc into your life. That's the way the devil operates. He moves us in our emotions. He moves us in all these kinds of things. He pushes all of the buttons that he knows works. While at the same time, God is trying to deal with us and steer us into his kingdom. And this is the dichotomy. This is what's happening in the world today. Listen, there is a battle going on for the hearts and the souls of men. 
Yeah. It is of an eternal consequence. Yeah. Listen, this isn't the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl. This is about people who are going to spend an eternity somewhere. They're going to either spend eternity with God and all of His glory in the place where they are rejoicing in Revelation 12, 12, that the devil has been cast out, or they're going to spend eternity into the place where he is ultimately destined. Imagine that for a minute. That, that's your options. And there is no middle option, is there? There's not this medium place that's kind of, it's either here or there. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God cast the devil out of heaven. And I have no intention of going where he's at. Look around in the world today. Look at all the destruction. Look at all the problems. Is this anything like what you want to spend eternity in? And believe me, hell's going to be a hundred times even unconscionably beyond the craziness that we see in the world. It's going to be, it's going to be beyond anybody's imagination. I mean, we're already there, aren't we? I mean, 30 or 40 years ago, I couldn't have even imagined where we're at today. If you would have told me the situation, I'd probably said, you know what? Surely the Lord's already came. That has to be the tribulation. But here we are. And it's just like in the days of Noah. The word of the Lord is going forth. The devil is doing his way to push people. And God is doing his way of dealing with people. And the question comes to this. Which way are we going to go? What side are we going to choose? I just want to pray this morning. Lord, I'm just so grateful to be here this morning to know that you have given us another day, Lord, to worship you, another day to decide, another day, Lord, to submit ourselves to you, Lord, to submit ourselves to you in such a way that your Holy Spirit would come into us and transform us into new creatures. Lord, we know that the devil's got a plan, but we know you have a greater plan. Lord, you have the ultimate plan. And Lord, it is my prayer this morning. And Lord, even as I have studied for this message and if I, I have pondered it even through the night, that you would touch the hearts of your people and help them to recognize that when you're dealing with them, that we need to submit. If you've got your hand on something in our life, that we need to submit. We need to turn to you. In each and every way, holding nothing back, Lord. Lord, I just pray for this nation that we're living in, Lord. I pray that you would pour your spirit out, Lord, as it goes in America, so as it goes around the world. Lord, from this very place that you would begin to pour out your spirit, that a mighty revival of the Holy Spirit and a move of God and the gospel could emanate from this land, Lord, and begin to spread even around the world.